Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our continued study of Holy Week. Today, we're going to be looking at Good Friday. And, and one of the things I think has been really exciting for Ken and I is that we've had this opportunity to really build into Holy Week in a way that we wouldn't have been able to just on a, any given Sunday morning setting, right? So we're able to put the Easter story in your home, and really, hopefully, you're able to study and talk about this as a family. And I think that really ramped up yesterday. With, with Ken talking to us about what happened on the significance of Thursday of Holy Week. It's been exciting for us to really jump into this, and I think it's an important thing. We've been talking about this idea that, you know, it, it's a pretty profound moment here. I mean, this, this week, Holy Week, it really is, is, it accounts for about a third of our Gospels. Like, there's so much in here, and many of Jesus' famous teachings come right out of this week. And I think when you realize that, it almost brings more significance or puts more weight on those teachings because you know how intense this time of his life really was, all of which leading us into what we'll study today and, and Jesus' death on the cross. See, my goal for today is to walk you through Friday and to start a conversation in a time that hopefully continues for you all day long with your family. And, and I'm going to just tell you, I will never be able to cover all of it in what happened during this time because so much happened. So you need to be engaging these scriptures for yourself. So I really would encourage you to jump into that. And as you jump into that with your family, it's important to us that we keep coming back to these three points that we want you to hold close um, all the time as you're going through this, remembering these three very important things about what Jesus was going through. The first was that everything that Jesus goes through, he goes through willingly. The second is that everything that Jesus goes through, he goes through for you. And, and the third thing is that because of Jesus' sacrifice, everything changes for you and for me. So before we really get rolling into this, this talk, I want to kind of think back to what Ken was doing and, and really walk us through Monday, Thursday, the Last Supper, and all that was going on around it, I found it really interesting, um, some of the things that he brought up. And I wanted to kind of start there before we jump into where we're going with Friday, because there's a lot coming with Friday, but I think it's really important to revisit where we were at on Thursday. Ken did a great job talking to us about all those moments, those really reflective, heavier moments that were coming Thursday into late Thursday evening. And one of the things that I found really interesting is that as Jesus is sitting there with the disciples, just moments away from his arrest, moments away from all of this really taking off, he's still modeling for them, living this life of servanthood, living this life of love, and humbly investing into others, literally washing the feet of his disciples. And, you know, Jesus is God. And I love how Ken brought that up, that he has all the supreme authority and power that's given to him, and yet he just continues to live so opposite of the ways that you and I would. He doesn't use that power and authority to find rankings and titles, and he doesn't lord it over them, no. He humbly serves them and continues to invest into them and teach them and command them on the ways of love. So Ken left us off in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus praise. It's this intense moment where he's literally sweating blood and fully surrendering to God's will in the end, and, and he's just moments away from his arrest. And that's where Ken really left off, and, and it leads us into where we're going today with, with what we call Good Friday, which is kind of where I wanted to start. Why in the world is Jesus' death on the cross that day considered Good Friday? Why is it good? You know, I thought it was really neat how Ken explained to us why Thursday of Holy Week is called Monday Thursday. We've all heard it, and I don't know that we all understood it. And Ken told us that that word Monday is all about this command that, that Jesus gave his disciples, right? Jesus commands his disciples to love others and to love one another. And, and, and that's a, that was a really cool and interesting fact to learn. Well, for a lot of us, we've heard Friday called Good Friday. And have you ever asked yourself why that is? There doesn't seem to be a lot of good going on around his arrest, trials, torture, and gruesome death on the cross, yet we call it good. So why would that be? Well, it's because by his death, Jesus became the final and complete sacrifice for our sins. We are saved through what Jesus did for us on the cross. We can't earn this. We can't erase our own guilt. We can't do anything ourselves to overcome our sin. So Jesus does it for us. This is why. 
we call it Good Friday, not because it was a good day for Jesus, but because it was a good day for all of us. This is the moment that we're leading into today where Jesus willingly moves to the cross for us all. So when Jesus left, uh, when Jesus did this, he, he did this for us and he did it willingly. Um, one of the things I wanted to do is kind of go back and pick up right where Ken left off. If you remember, I told you earlier, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, and Jesus was there praying with his disciples. And this is where Judas betrays him with a kiss and he's taken under arrest, which leads us into our study of Good Friday today. And I'm just going to say this before I get rolling. I already feel like I'm in a little bit of fast forward here as I'm getting started. And I need to slow myself down because so much happened on this day and I had a lot of fun writing it all out. And I'm going to put a lot more in the blog on our website that I'm going to get into here today. So much happened. There are so many little intricacies of what happened around Good Friday that I would have loved to grab hold of and talk to you about. And, and, and I just kind of want to jump into the main points on this video and really lead you to study this at home, really, what we've been trying to do, right? Get this Easter story into your house. So like, I, I, I will tell you, I was a little overwhelmed with how I was going to present all this information to you. And my mind was racing with different ideas and thoughts about where I could go and what I could do. So I kind of had to take a step back and, and I looked at Friday for what it was. And I, and I kind of broke it down four ways. I, I kind of looked at it like this. There's four major things that happen. The first is his arrest. That's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where we'll start. The second is Jesus on trial. And it's pretty interesting. There's six quote unquote trials. I mean, they, were, <laughs> they all knew what they wanted to do in the end with them anyway, but we'll call them trials. Then there's Jesus on the cross. That would be the third area. And that's the area we're really going to focus. And another beautiful part that I really won't be able to get into in this video is Jesus's burial, which is another awesome thing to study, which you'll have the Bible references to do at home. So I want to pick this back up in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus returns from praying to find his disciples asleep. They're unable to keep their eyes open uh, and, and, and just, just to be uh, somewhat giving them some kind of leash here. It is the middle of the night. I know I get a little grumpy after nine. You know, we're heading into like the wee hours of the morning here. So, you know, they were asleep. They're, they're, they're the disciples. They're doing their thing. Jesus wakes them up and says, can't you stay awake with me a little bit? I mean, my time has come here, and, and that kind of leads us to where we'll start our talk in the first section I wanted to look at with you, which is Jesus arrested. So the scripture references for this would be Matthew 26, 45 to 56, Mark 14, 43 to 51, Luke 22, 47 to 54, and John 18, 1 to 14. And I'd really encourage you to dive into this section. So this is where Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. This is what we see here. He comes in with this mob. He walks up. He kisses Jesus. And, and kind of that's the sign, right, that they know who he is. I think they probably did anyway. But Peter continues to make what I lovingly call these Peter moments. And it's kind of wild. Peter is all wound up, grabs his sword, lops off the ear of, of, of a guy there. Jesus has to kind of calm him down and once again explains, hey, by the way, I can get out of this if I want, Peter. We're not here to swing swords and do the fighting. We could call down angel armies if we needed to. That's not why I'm here. I'm doing this willingly. I'm jumping into this for you. And we're going to get this done my way. And I thought that was a really interesting moment that, again, I, I won't jump into fully with you. But he was here to do this in this moment. And this, this arrest moment ends with us clearly seeing something important. And it was probably the one area that I wanted to grab most as, as, as we kind of walk out of this time in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that is that the disciples all run away. I, I just, this stood out to me, and I just wanted to grab this one moment and look at it. Matthew 26, verse, starting in verse 55. At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, so this is the mob of people all around them, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. That really stood out to me, that line. In Mark, it goes as far to say that one of them, actually someone grabbed a hold of his robe and he ran away stark naked, just fleeing off into the, into the wilderness, just ah, you know, running for his life, naked and afraid. And, and I kept thinking about that. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? Jesus has prepared these men for this. He's told them it's going to happen over and over again. He, he's now watching them all run away in fear, and it leaves him alone, doesn't it? 
So it's now Jesus and his accusers, which is going to lead us out of the Garden of Gethsemane and to his trial. So we can read about Jesus on trial in, in Matthew 26, 57 through 27, 25, in Mark 14, in Luke 22, and in John 18. But here we're going to see um, that as Jesus is arrested, the disciples all flee, and he's led straight into this series of trials. And I'm going to call them trials, but, but the reality is they're just kind of hoops that the, the Jewish leadership are, are kind of doing that they have to do to get where they want to go, which is to kill Jesus, right? That's, that's the goal. That's where they're headed. So wherever these trials lead, that's the outcome. So they're kind of trials, I guess we'll call them. But there's six of them that take place. And, and I, I think that they're interesting to kind of walk through. The, the, the one thing that's really interesting about these six trials that you need to understand is they, they're hoops that they have to jump through politically because the Jews aren't in charge, right? The Roman Empire is. So while the Jewish leadership wants to kill Jesus, they really don't have the authority to do that. So there's specific things that they're going to have to accomplish, namely a trial, a, a sentence, and, and kind of getting them to this place where they can prove to their Roman leadership that he should be killed. So they got to do this process, and they're doing it rather quickly and in the middle of the night. So with all of that said, there's some powerful moments that are going to unfold during this that I'm not going to hit that I'll actually get a chance to maybe jump into some when we talk on Monday about what was happening after. And, and that main one that we see that I think is very a very popular story is Peter denying Jesus three times, which we see happening during this time. We also see a devastated Judas, um, just riddled with guilt, um, trying to give the money back, trying to figure out what he's going to do, uh, eventually ending up killing himself. And, and there's so many powerful and interesting moments and conversations and these these times between like Jesus and Pilate, G Jesus and Herod. There's, there's just some amazing interchanges and just this struggle of what's going to happen through this day. But I kind of wanted to walk through in generalities what happens during these six trials, right? So the first one that we see is in, in the middle of the night, he's led out of the garden and he's interrogated by the high priest Caiaphas's father-in-law. And I'll call this Jesus's interrogation. And, and basically what's happening here is two things. One, he's being interrogated and they're trying to pull an accu accusation against him. They're going to kind of come at him and continue to try to find a way to, to just pin this thing on him where they can kill him. The second thing that's happening is, um, is that Caiaphas's father-in-law is buying time while the, they gather all the leaders together. Remember, it's the middle of the night. They don't have texting. They can't get these people together. So one of the things that's happening is yeah, this guy's just buying time, right? While they gather the, San, the, 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 the leaders at the, San, the Sanhedrin all comes together. And that's when Jesus is led to his main trial. And, and that was um, Jesus before Caiaphas, the high priest. This is the main trial where he is eventually condemned. But they really struggle to find anything to really lock in this death sentence, which I find really interesting. Finally, they get a loose claim to stick and it's all they really want, right? I told you these are trials, right? They're just kind of what they are. But, you know, they finally get to a place where they have a claim against him. And I'm just going to read this section of what was going on at this time in Mark 14, starting in verse 55. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they didn't find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet, yet even their testimonies did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on, on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You've heard this, the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. So Jesus has been interrogated and has faced the chief priest and the Sanhedrin in this main trial. And he's been found guilty, which is where this was headed, 
all along. And, and, and then there's a sentencing hearing, which is their third Jewish trial, which convenes to just kind of sentence him to death so that he can be taken to his Roman superior, to, to the Roman superiors to really have this official death sentence made. So it's around dawn now, right? So yeah, this is a little bit of a long night for Jesus, I think we could say, where Jesus is sentenced to death by the Jews. And, and you re may remember that they have to have the approval of the Roman leadership, right? I've been telling you, they're jumping through these hoops. These first three things were just to get them to a place where they could prove to Pilate, Herod, the, the Roman leadership, that Jesus should be killed. And this leads us to now Jesus being brought before Pilate for the first time. These are some of the more fascinating moments that I think take place during this particular portion of Good Friday. And I wish I had time to jump into them in detail with you, but I want to keep moving and just kind of show you some of the highlights. Jesus is led to Pontius Pilate to stand his fourth trial. Again, one right after the other, beatings, accusations, violence against him. And here he is now before Pilate, and he's being um, charged by the Jews, and there's a lot of political pressure on Pilate here. And I think this is important to see. You know, he doesn't want a big rebellion or revolt from these Jewish leaders at this time. Like, he's got to kind of watch his step here. He knows they're wound up. He knows they want to kill Jesus. And he's got to figure his way through all this because, you know, he doesn't quite see a reason to sentence Jesus to death. But he knows he's going to have a problem on his hands if he doesn't. Now, luckily, he finds a loophole in the system and realizes that Jesus is from Galilee, which falls outside of his jurisdiction, and he kind of sends him off to Herod, who's in charge of, of, of the Galileans. And, and it gives him a chance to say, whew, you know, I'm out of this. I'm sending him to Herod. And Herod's actually excited to meet Jesus because he's heard about all these miracles that Jesus has been doing, and he wants to see some. And I think it's really interesting. And the one thing that comes out that I think impresses both of these guys as they talk to Jesus, and also is an important thing for us to look at, is that Jesus stays silent during all of this time. Luke 23, verse 9, he plied, uh, he plied him, this is Herod, with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. I, I love that. Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in, elegant, in an elegant robe, robe, they sent him back to Pilate. See, that line there, I think, is really cool. But Jesus gave no answer. Another place that just pops to me in Scripture. You know, Pilate was impressed by the fact that he stayed quiet as he's being accused of all this stuff. And if you think about it, it's hard to stay quiet when people are falsely accusing you of anything, right? But I want to just take a moment and think about what's going on here. We've been looking at this week of Holy Week, right, the whole way through. And isn't it interesting that earlier in the week, we see that these guys can't win a debate against Jesus, right? He, he, he outthinks them, he outtalks them in every way. Jesus could have talked his way out of this if he wanted to. But instead, he stays, stays silent because he's going to where he wants to go willingly. He's going there for us. And he's going there to change everything. If he talks, he probably wins the debate. So instead, he chooses to stay silent as all these men just throw accusation and violence and crazy at him over and over again. I think that takes a lot of strength. And I think that's a beautiful thing to see here. So Jesus is taken from Herod back to Pilate, who very reluctantly agrees with the angry mob to have Jesus killed. And we're just going to read about it here. Luke 23, starting in verse 13, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I've examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us, as you can see. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him, then release him. So, Pilate's trying everything at this point, basically saying, hey, I'll flog him, I'll whip him, I'll, I'll tear him up a little bit for you, and then let's just get him out of here, because this just doesn't sit right. And, and it continues. But the crowd shouted, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas has been, who, uh, who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them. Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. 
But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. So I want you to think about this. Remember Palm Sunday, just a couple days earlier? These same people that are now yelling, kill him, were the same ones cheering for him when he rode in on a donkey, donkey cheering Hosanna as he came in on that day. It's just incredible, right? And this leads us to Jesus on the cross. So the cross is a, the, the magnificent part of this whole day, and it can be read about in Matthew 27, 27 to 54, Mark 15, 16 to 41, Luke 22, 54 to uh, uh, Luke 23, 45, and in John 18 as well. So I'm just going to read this to you. I'm just going to get into it. I'm not going to paraphrase it. I'm going to read what happened on that day. But before we do, I want you to think about what Ken told us yesterday, that Jesus had the power to end this at any time he wants to. Remember, he's God. We, were, we, we saw today in the scriptures, and if you study him later, you'll see him tell Peter after Peter cuts the guy's ear off, you know, bad swing of the sword, I guess, but like when he cuts the guy's ear off and he says, you know, I could call down the angel armies at any time here. So we're going to read this in scripture. And as we read this and as you reflect on this on this day, I want to keep bringing you back to those three points that we've told you you need to keep close to your heart as we move through this. The first thing that you need to remember is that everything that Jesus goes through he goes through willingly. The second thing that you need to remember is that everything that Jesus goes through, he goes through for you. And the third thing that is so important and it will really come out on Easter Sunday is that everything Jesus went through changed the, everything for you and I moving forward. So with that said, I'm going to read this and we'll close with this uh, part of Jesus on the cross. Matthew 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted, twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon and forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. They, there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness overcame all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And then Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice. He gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who, who were with him, were, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. This is where I'll leave you today. 
The scripture references we'd like you to study with with your family here for Good Friday are Matthew 26 and 27, Mark 14 and 15, Luke 22 and 23, and John 18 and 19. And as you reflect and talk and kind of keep this conversation going with your family today, just remember, everything Jesus went through, he went through willingly. Everything Jesus went through, he went through for you. And because Jesus went through it, everything has changed for you and for, I, for me. We get to walk into eternal life someday. We get to walk in, in a personal and beautiful and intimate relationship with God because of what Jesus did on this day. So this was a tough day. It was a brutal day, a painful day for Jesus, but a good Friday for all of us. We'll see you on Sunday when Ken talks to us about the beauty of Resurrection Day.